Okay, welcome. Again, this is the webinar, Limit to the Power of Privileged Users with Privileged Identity Management and Privileged Activity Monitoring. Your speakers for today are myself, Jane Grafton from Lieberman Software. We've got Laszlo and Ferenz from Balbot IT Security. And this is the contact information. I will be sending out a copy of the presentation after uh, the webinar, so you will have our information uh, in your inbox shortly. All right, the agenda for today. We're going to tell you a little bit about who we are as companies. Then we're going to talk about the key privileged user security challenges that are we're facing out there today, and then how we solve the problem of securing those challenges. We're going to show you a demonstration of our integrated solution. We're going to talk about next steps and then answer your questions. So first I'll start. This is going to be back and forth between Balbit and Lieberman. We're two companies, but we have an integrated solution, so it's the uh, power of the two of us. Lieberman Software was founded in 1978. Uh, it became an ISV in 1994. We are the pioneers of privileged identity management. In 1999, we released the first uh, random password manager. And now we've got uh, over 1,200 enterprise customers in all verticals. We especially have a strong presence in government and national defense. We are followed by the analysts, including Gartner, Forrester, 451 Group. We're U.S.-based, management-owned, and profitable. And we have technology integrations with a number of uh, related technologies, like Balibit, including uh, Sim Solutions, ArcSight, um, RSA, Envision, Q1 Labs. Um, we are a Microsoft managed gold partner. We um, integrate with IBM technologies, VMware, Oracle, Talus, um, hardware security modules, etc. And now I will turn it over to Laszlo to speak about Balibit. Thank you, Jim. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Laszlo Sabu. I am the Precious and Integration Manager of Balibit IT Security. Uh, just a short introduction about my company. Volabit is a European-based, fast-growing, technology-focused company. Our core competency is IT security development. In the early phases, the company focused on uh, Syslog NG, and it became de facto log management standard product in the open source space. Parallel, Volabit launched its first commercial firewall product, the Zorb Gateway, which had become the basic platform after cutting edge privileged activity monitoring appliance called uh, Shell Control Box. Today, uh, SCB uh, is an abbreviation of Shell Control Box. It's a flagship and sold all over the world in every continent. Today, the company size is uh, around 130 people, but we are growing fast, both in employee number and revenue. Last year, we grew about 77% in revenue and has become a $10 million company. We were included three times in the Deloitte Fast 50 Central European Technology List. Okay. Great. Yeah, Thank you very much. Okay, now let's talk about the challenges. So as you're pretty well aware, security breaches are coming at us from every angle. People are losing laptops. People are cracking administrative passwords. They're trying to break into your network any way they can, and they're taking advantage of poor practices by employees and companies, and they're taking advantage of technologies to break in. So how do we stop these? There's just been so much going on. So uh, one of the key ways hackers gain access is the misuse of administrative privileges. So what they do is they'll, they'll crack a administrative credential on, let's say, a router or a server because maybe it's the default password, or it's easy to crack, it's, a, it's less than 15 characters, and then they'll leapfrog from system to system, and they'll take your data, they'll clean out your company, they, um, you know, it's, it's not, a good, not a good place to be. So let's talk about what we mean by administrative credentials. So uh, Lieberman Software is in the business of managing and securing privileged accounts everywhere in the enterprise and cloud. So we're talking about the administrator, domain, local accounts on your servers and desktops and network operating systems. We're talking about the sys, sysadmin accounts of your databases. They're in middleware. They're the proxy and gateway accounts. They're on your network infrastructure. Every router, switch, gateway has an administrative credential. They're in applications and they're in VM environments. So those are the accounts we're talking about. And now I'll turn over to Laszlo to talk about what the problem is with those. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Sure. Uh, okay, let's. 
start <laughs> short game uh, called Who is Who. Uh, I'm interested if, if anyone knows Walter Powell or Roger Gironi or Terry Childs. Uh, have anyone heard about them? Do you know who they are? Uh, if not, I have to reveal their secret. They are not sportsmen or politicians. They are quite common system administrators who became uh, very famous, uh, rather notorious uh, all over the world. First guy is uh, Walter Powell, who is um, actually who was an IT manager at the Baltimore Substance Abuse System INC. Um, he's a disgruntled IT manager because he, he hacked his former employee's computer and replaced his boss's presentation with a porn image. To see a pornographic image instead of the financial results and a huge screen uh, at the meeting together with the board, it can be really, really embarrassing. But Okay, you can say it's not the end of the world. Um, let's see who is the next guy, Richard, Duni Richard Gironio, and what exactly he did. He was the system administrator at uh, UBS Payne Weber um, and was, was found guilty on computer sabotage for writing, planting, and activating a logic bomb that took down to 2,000 servers in a company. The attack left the financial giant traders unable to make trades, that, which is the lifeblood of the company, for a day in some offices and for several weeks in other offices. Executives at UBS never reported the cost of lost business, but did say the attack cost the company uh, more than $3.1 million to get the system back up and running. It isn't funny at all. Let's see who is the third guy, Terry Child. He is the most famous or notorious, uh, whether you see, uh, of those three guys. He was a technology network engineer at the city of San Francisco, and he has committed an internal denial of service attack against the San Francisco Fiber One network. Uh, he has withheld the network's passwords for over 12 days and has held the system in his, ha in his hands. Uh, in those 12 days, no one could access or log in into the system with uh, system administrator rights because he was the only one who, who knew the password. So it's, it's getting more and more serious. Uh, what can we do against these illegal and really unexpected and unweighted activities? Do you have any idea how many of those incidents were revealed? Well, we have some. Uh, we made a survey at uh, 2011 at SysAdmin's Day and activity with 200 respondents. Uh, we get quite surprising answers to our questions. Um, let's see them. 45% has said that they are usually uh, downloading illegal content at their workplace. 48 said that usually or sometimes at least they are breaking the firewall rules because they can do they can have access to the firewalls and they can, they can change the, the rules for the favor. 29% uh, has committed data theft in the company. 25% is uh, accessing sensitive data quite regularly. They can access, they can do because they have all the rights. 16% are reading others' mails, which is which is can be really embarrassing and and problematic for even for the management and for their colleagues. And at least 15 percentage has uh, destroyed evidence. Um, these are the top six illegal activities by system administrators based on this survey. And um, <clears throat> the guys who were answering all the questions, most of them are system database or network administrators at various size and various uh, profile companies. Um, I just would like to, to highlight those three numbers at the top right. 74 percentage of the respondents have committed at least one offense that could have cost them their job. As a CIO, you have to know definitely about those events. Uh, only 8 percentage said that uh, they fill the gap between their privileges and their accountability, and only the 8 percent would protest against the observation of their work. So sometimes uh, monitoring them can, can ease on their life as well because usually they get offended by some kind of events which are not committed by them, but they not, don't have any uh, evidences to, to tell their bosses or the other guys in the company that, okay, it wasn't me. You can check the logs or you can check the, the, the audit trails, whatever. And <clears throat> the third one 
is uh, 41 percentage uh, of the respondents have been in a situation at work where they would have needed some evidence to prove their innocence. That's why I uh, explained that there is no need to, at, at any comment. It is a serious risk in your, your organization as well. Uh, the system administrators are the, the most privileged users in every company. They can access sensitive information such as uh, financial CRM data, personal records, credit card numbers, whatever. Furthermore, several administrators typically access the same privileged account, sharing the account password, which could be treated as, uh, not, not treated as secure from this point. Consequently, it is very, very hard to answer the question of even more difficult to provide a proof of any misuse. In a large enterprise, there can be a huge number of servers which are administered by hundreds of thousands of system administrators. Let's see what to do with them. Jay? Right. So basically, you can't trust anybody and you need evidence. So uh, what we propose is to do two things. One is to control those administrative accounts and then to, to monitor them. So what's the threat posed by those privileged accounts that I talked about earlier? Well, they're the most powerful accounts in the organization. They provide access to the most sensitive information. They're rarely changed. Uh, and known to many, and because of that, there's no individual, individual user accountability. People aren't changing their passwords and uh, frequently enough. They're sharing them amongst their administrators, and that's just not effective. So let's ask you some questions. Are you or is your organization at risk? So first of all, do you know where all your privileged accounts are? You can't secure the accounts if you don't know where they are. Uh, who is sharing credentials? And if you do have administrators sharing credentials, are they accountable? Can you associate a login by Jane Grafton to a server, or is it just an admin who accessed it? Do your passwords change? Uh, how often do they change? You, you know, for most regulatory mandates, you need to change your passwords every 90 days. And if you don't, will you pass your next IT audit? And then will your passwords withstand social, uh, dictionary and social attacks? So are they complex and long enough? And then, do you know what your admins are doing on privileged assets? So once someone gets onto a privileged asset, do you know what they're doing? These are questions that we can certainly answer. Laszlo? Thank you. Uh, sometimes there is an internal need to monitor the privileged accounts, but the ability of the monitor user activity and resource access has become a part of the standard of due care for a wide variety of regulations across many industry segments. A few, just a few examples. Uh, Cobit is the underlying control framework of Servants actually. The Cobit controls for security monitoring, change management, securing data require the ability to monitor user activity and resource access. Uh, the PCID assessed payment card industry data security standard. It references a need to audit access to careful that data and the need to implement an access control system. ISO 27002. Uh, references uh, controls for monitoring system use, controls for system administration and operations, and management of uh, security incidents. And at the end, there is a uh, high P, Basel 1, 2, uh, and GPG. Uh, GPG is a, a good practice guide that uh, the UK government has, has been issued. So those are quite similar uh, requirements which are uh, targeting the, the monitoring of the secure, secure privileged accounts. <coughs> Let's see, what is the limitation of the logging? Why we feel that logging is not enough for a regulatory compliance? Well, uh, logging as a technology is uh, originally was developed in the 1980s by Eric Allman and as a part of the Sandmill project. It was initially used to debug the Sandmill's buggy code and it, it has been proved so valuable that other applications began using it as well. Syslog has become the standard logging solution in Unix and Unix like systems without any authoritative published specification. It just, it just happened. Since, since then, centralized and local logging is a, is a must have on every and single IT system for monitoring, analysis, and basic auditing reasons. But there are many blind spots which are not covered simply by logging. Uh, so, where did these blind spots came from? Uh, the most active it's logging acts like fingerprint forensics at a crime scene. Uh, database logs and system logs show the results of what the user did, but then you need to backtrack from this arcane evidence and figure out what it means and, and how it got there. 
um, there are many, many applications, and uh, especially cloud applications and legacy software or custom software, they don't produce their own logs. Summarizing this whole, logging is about writing tons of records about what's going on in the system or application on application level, and it's a must-have. But privileged activity monitoring is about creating evidences about really who did what uh, in our system. If you see this, this pyramid at the top, you see activity records like like uh, have been recorded by a security camera system. System logs are most like snapshots about how our system are running. Okay, let's see how do we solve the problem. Okay. Yes, so um, we solve the problem by mitigating the risks through automation. So these two solutions are integrated together to provide privilege identity management and privilege activity monitoring. So we're going to control and secure the actual administrative accounts. We're going to make sure that only authorized individuals get those accounts when they're uh, at it for a time, a short time, and then it's audited. And then when they get onto those systems, we're going to audit what they do so you have a complete closed loop end-to-end -end secure trail. So how does it look? So first of all, when it comes to privilege identity management, privilege identities cannot – wow, that's a great slide. Um, <laughs> let me just say it's really impossible to manage privilege identities with the wrong technology. So uh, it's important that you have a solution that makes it easy for you to automate the management of those technologies. You don't want to add any more complexity to your infrastructure. So. What we do is we provide a solution called Enterprise Random Password Manager, and it does four things, and it does it really, really well. First thing is it identifies and documents your critical IT assets, their privilege accounts, and their interdependencies. So it finds all of your privilege accounts and how they are used. Then we enforce the rules for password strength, uniqueness, and change frequency, and we synchronize the changes across all dependencies. That sounds like a mouthful, but what it means is we take those passwords, we throw them in a back-end database, we encrypt them, we make them incredibly strong, and then when we change passwords, we propagate those password changes to everywhere those passwords are in use. Then what we do is we delegate so that only appropriate personnel can access privilege accounts in a timely manner. So we provide a web inter interface, for users to log into, to retrieve credentials, uh, only when they need access to those uh, devices or those assets. And then all of that is audited, and we alert for any unusual activity. So that's the big picture of what Lieberman Software does. It secures those identities across all physical and virtual stacks, and every privilege identity, whether it's in a host OS, a guest OS, an application, presents a potential security threat if unsecured. So we lock them down. Nobody ever walks out the door knowing the password for a privileged account. We also can provide dashboards to pinpoint events and trends that you'd never detect in logs and <clears throat> find groups of systems with unusual patterns of privileged access. So if you're doing any kind of analysis, you might identify behavioral changes by individual IT staff. That would be an upfront. Um, so now let me turn over to Lazar to talk about how Shell Control Box does the privilege activity monitoring. Okay, let's see how to extend this, this uh, functionality with the shell control box. Uh, the basic of the story was, as I mentioned, was a special firewall which was able to manage application level traffic. And uh, we get quite um, custom needs from, from different kind of customers that would we be able to, to uh, monitor oh, traffic, uh, like encrypted traffic like SSH or Telnet or RDP sessions. And we were thinking about that, okay, that firewall is not specially designed for doing that, but with some modification, we will be able, because we have the technology base to do that. That's how Shell Control Box uh, came alive. Uh, is it an, is a an, uh, network security tool, and it is able to audit and control remote server administration at the protocol level. It's an independent network device which sits between the administrator and the server networks and inspects all the network traffic. It is able to authenticate and control the users when they access the servers. And all the traffic details are stored in high quality audit trail files which can be replayed back like watching a movie. On the technology side, they are not really video files. They are uh, network traffic dumps, but, but we have a special player which can reconstruct for you the original image, the original picture of what the administrator on the remote session worker has used. 
Um, you can imagine that it helps you answer the question of who did what and when on your critical servers. If you just have to log in on a web interface, search for a username or a comment uh, you are looking for, and it gives you the result, and you have to check just a few minutes of the LD trails. Fracon <coughs> um, Roblox supports a wide range of other functions from authentication, for example, integration with password management systems across uh, granular access policy enforcement up to real time alerting and blocking. By auditing all the accesses, it is uh, possible to conduct ad hoc forensic analysis and gather information on user activities. It can be login, file access, file transfer, launch a program, stop or start a service, and so on. Even more, you can search in the index of the trails. So you can search for a comment and for, for any text appearing on the screen. Other key features are real-time activity monitoring, temper-proof, high-quality audit trails, movie-like playback, and search on the interface, um, file transfer auditing, and, and this is an independent transparent audit device, and of course, it has customizable compliance and activity reports. Let's see a typical scenario with privileged activity monitoring. My colleague, Ferenc Shipos, will, will uh, uh, reveal more secret about how it's working in the practice. I just want to show you a, a really high uh, design of that. Uh, at every organization, there are many servers, many server administration, administrators, network administrators, database admins. They have their own accounts at every server or at many servers. They have uh, the, the shared administrator account. And there are many routers and switches and Windows terminal servers. To redesign this whole network to put different kind of restrictions within the network is a really difficult thing to do. What you can do with Shell Control Box is to put a proxy-based technology between those networks and to tell your administrators that you have to go through, uh, an, on the network level, it's an invisible device, but you have to go through on that level and it just, just gives you access control and the authentication and the authorization methods. So it's, it's really easy to manage the accesses with a single box put in between the servers and the users. Um, it's also really easy for the auditors to log into the web interface and check what happened today within the system, or check the reports, what kind of sessions were recorded last day or this day. Um, let's see a typical ERP and SCB integration scenario. This figure shows that one typical integration scenario of Shackle Box with ERP app. Actually, it's an SCB centric scenario where the Shackle Control Box authenticates the user to the server. In addition, storing credentials locally, SCB can seamlessly integrate it with the Enterprise Random Password Manager, Libre Software's Privilege Identity Management Solution. That way, the passwords of the target server can be managed centrally using the ERP app while SCB ensures that the protected servers can be accessed only via the shell control box, since the users do not know the passwords required for direct access. By integrating shell control box with ERPM, organizations can enjoy the benefits of both technologies. Users could continue to access server and <coughs> other network resources, just they were used to, and SCB could control and monitor their activities why privileged and shared accounts passwords are never disclosed. The users have to know only the, the pass, their passwords to the shell control box, and all the rest is based on the technology of shell control box and the enterprise and the password manager. Um, there can be another ERPM centric scenario as well, where the user directly connects to the enterprise and the password manager web interface. ERPM does the authentication to the server and SCB just audits the working session without any controlling functions. Okay, let's see what are the key benefits of integration. Jane? Oh, great, thanks, Laszlo. So <clears throat> now you've got a central automatic management of the passwords. In either scenario, you've got one phase two of the system. You have granular access control to privilege accounts and systems. 
There's independent audit-proof monitoring of the access. We've got customizable reports on either side, both from our side, from the privilege identity management side, and from the activity monitoring. Of course, those are going to be much more interesting. And it's improved single sign-on for privileged users. So they just use their regular AD or LDAP authentication. They log in, and then we do all the background um, checking. So what are the results? So first of all, you now have an authoritative list of privileged accounts on all managed devices. So you have visibility. Authorized IT staff can quickly access systems with their user credentials using this sort of single sign-on scenario. Privileged credentials, credentials are stored and will be changed according to a policy that you determine. So in the background, the, the passwords are constantly changing. When you need access to it, you go through the shell control box, and the shell control box will retrieve the current credential from ERPM. All the access to your uh, critical assets are recorded, searchable, indexed, etc., and ultimately your keys to the kingdom are secure. That's the bottom line. So, what differentiates our combined solution? First of all, it's very rapid and complete de deployments in hours, not months. Um, We've designed Enterprise Random Password Manager to have minimal professional services required. You install, deploy, and it just works. It's got superior auto discovery, correlation, and propagation technology, so it can find all those accounts, can correlate their usage, and can propagate the password changes to everywhere it's in use. With respect to Shell Control Box, it's transparent, multi-protocol solution with granular access control, auditing, and forensics. Both these solutions are enterprise ready for scale, scope, and complex dynamic infrastructures. As systems come on and off the network, we will be able to rein them in and gain control of them. Both of our solutions have comprehensive open documentation. We rely on open standards, and it's integrated out of the box. That's really important. So I'm going to turn it over now to Ferenc, who is going to do a demonstration. Thank you, Jane. So I'm just going to share my desktop, so you should be uh, able to see it in a few moments. Okay, until the Ferenc is preparing, I would like to congratulate to Nathaniel and A. Miller, who has uh, just wrote a message to us that Child is the guy who logged out San Francisco. But, uh, that's true. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, you got uh, some kind of virtual prize for, for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the meantime, I've shared my desktop. Could you, Jane and Laszlo, confirm that uh, you all see it? Yeah, I see it. It's a nice one. Yep, no worries. Okay, so uh, what I prepared for today are three scenarios, um, three usage scenarios where end users will log into target systems, servers, and they, those imaginary users will try to do uh, um, example activities. Uh, Laszlo talked about the, uh, the concept of how shared control box works, um, about its proxy technology, uh, how transparently it can be implemented into a networking infrastructure. Um, my infrastructure consists of basically two systems, um, a Windows client that I'm going to use uh, here that you see the, the desktop um, shared for, um, and two target systems, one uh, Windows 7 um, target and the Unix box. So to start out with, I'd like to um, uh, demonstrate a scenario where our end user tries to log into one of the company's Linux system and without full integration, this user will try to use um, a server account which is not a personalized account. So for, uh, for being able to access it, uh, the user will uh, specify the account that Shack Control Box should use to log into the target system the user will authenticate themselves uh, with uh, their Active Directory personal account and to be able to log in as the, uh, server, uh, as the server account, the user will need to turn to Lieberman's uh, web interface to retrieve the password and explicitly paste it into the, to the password prompt. Uh, this is just to demonstrate how it would work with Shared Control Box and no proper or no full integration between the two products so that you have a comparison when I show the second scenario where full integration will be show, showcased. Um, so the user, uh, first of all, let's say the user tries to log in as a regular uh, user like uh, his personal account. 
the user tries to do some example activity, but shared control box will deny access to the pseudo command in real time, we will block this type of activity because it was deemed uh, risky by the uh, security personnel at the company, so the user will be logged out. Just to uh, let you know, the only way to tell I'm not logging in directly to the system, uh, to the target system, to prove it to you, I would need to log in to share control box interface and show the uh, list of active connections where you can see that there's an ongoing connection where public user has been specified. So I go back there and I try to run the pseudo command and I got disconnected by shared control box automatically because the pseudo command matched a certain rule which lists uh, risky activities. So to be able to execute a pseudo command, the user realizes that uh, he needs to be logged in as a privileged user. So he uh, tries again. This time specifies a server account that should give him enough privilege to execute the pseudo command. And then shared control box asks for his personal account, because the demo admin account is a shared account. The user specifies his personal account and password, then shared control box asks for the uh, password of the server account. What the user needs to do this time, he needs to go to uh, the Lieberman interface, log into the web interface, go to the uh, listed systems, and retrieve the password from the system manually, copy it to the clipboard, go back to the prompt, and invert it. Now he was able to log in, and now he could execute uh, yeah, sudo command and be able to um, delete this file. So you need to, what you need to uh, note here that the user logged in and authenticated on SCB with a personal account, which has nothing to do with the actual server account. Shared control box in the background did some access control check, matched its so-called user mapping policies to see if the user is, should be able to use that server account, should the user be authorized to use, use that account. But still, without full integration, the user needed to uh, go to the Lieberman web interface and explicitly retrieve the account. If you come back here and see the list of active, co active connections, you can actually see that uh, shared control box shows that the actual person is called Balabit and the remote user, which uh, has been used for access, is demo admin. And by the way, um, the uh, authorizer with sufficient privileges has the possibility to uh, take a look at the on ongoing session and see what the user is doing. It's going to do a quick catch up. Sorry. And if you come back to the uh, real live session, you can see that whatever I type in my console instantaneously appears in the audit player. So the person doing the playback has the option to terminate the end user session anytime if he thinks the user is about to do something inappropriate. I hit the terminate button and you can see the end user got disconnected. Okay. Uh, taking the integration one step further, we thought it would be better if the end user would not need to reveal the password, but check control box could. Uh, once it does the uh, access control check and um, uh, grants the user access to that particular server account, it should be able to uh, retrieve the password from uh, the Lieberman Enterprise Password Manager automatically. So if the device is configured to work so, I can easily come to this connection, specify the server user I'd like to be, which is demo admin in this example again, provide my personal credentials, which by the way can be against Active Directory, Posixel, or these accounts for SSH can be managed and maintained locally on the device itself. I hit enter, and as you will see, okay, it's 
something wrong. Okay, I know what the problem is. The password is being checked out on Liberon's interface, so I need to uh, release it so that other user can retrieve it. Okay, so you can see I got logged in as demo admin without needing to type in the password manually. And if you come back to uh, Shell Control Boxes interface, refresh, you can see that uh, the Bollabit account uh, used the demo admin to log in. And by the way, I also have the option to terminate the session right from the web interface, which is exactly what I'm going to do, because I think the user should not be doing anything on this part of system at this time. Okay. The same thing happens for, uh, or is supported for, for RDP protocol as well. So in case you have Windows environments where we, you would like to take advantage of such functionality, uh, you could check control, you could set up share control box to act as a terminal service gateway and instruct your end users to use it as a standard RDP proxy and uncheck the option to use the same credentials on the, for the server side login. Uh, as the one they provide for the uh, remote desktop gateway access. Using this feature, when the end user tries to log into this particular system here, the end user defines the target account that they would like to use for login. If I hit connect, a window pops up that asks me to authorize or authenticate myself on this particular host, which I know is the actual terminal service gateway. So I'm going to use my personal Active Directory account, put in my password, I hit enter, and if I type the password correctly, check control box authenticates me against the Active Directory of that particular domain, checks if I'm allowed to log into the server at this time of the day um, using that particular account, and if so, tries to retrieve the password from, from the, um, the Enterprise Random Password Manager, and once it succeeded, I get my session. And as you can see, I managed to log in as an admin privileged user without actually knowing or retrieving the password explicitly for that account. And the, the reason I have the option to retrieve the password from from the, from the uh, Liberman interface, it's, uh, it's optional. I could uh, deny access to those passwords and give only a, um, access to the passwords for the, uh, for the service account that Shack Control Box uses to uh, talk to the Liberman uh, API. Okay, what the interesting part can be is the playback of such sessions. Let me generate some meaningful example activity. Let's say I'm, an ad, I'm, I'm a regular admin user. I managed to uh, escalate my uh, privileges by using Shack Control Box and uh, ask, asking access for the uh, demo admin account. Once I'm in, I'm, as part of my regular work, I'm going to start out of the services management console. And let's say I stop the print pooler service. I get distracted for whatever reason, I close this window without starting the service back up. This can happen easily. And if, um, if an auditor needs to find out what happened in the company's environment, a tool like Shell Control Box can be, can be uh, vital and uh, can come to the rescue. Let's say the administrator comes or the auditor comes to the web interface, sees on the timeline uh, in a daily view, can be changed from uh, monthly to minute granularity, that today there are 32 entries um, pertaining activities that happened in my environment. I know for sure that the service, 
the alerting system where end users complain about being um, unavailable is a Windows-based service, so I can easily uh, neglect SSH accounts and focus on um, RDP connections. But I also know for sure that the user needed to be able to log in and do interactive things so I can uh, filter out denied sessions and focus on only accepted ones. Okay, that's still uh, multiple sessions, and uh, if we um, imagine a real-life scenario, these sessions could be up to eight or multiple hours long. Obviously, I don't want to spend time playing those sessions back from uh, beginning to the end, even if the, the playback happens in movie-like format. That would take a considerable amount of time. So what I can choose to do is export all the trays, all, all the trails. I could have also checked and further filter on, okay, I know that the uh, to be able to stop the service, the user needed to use uh, admin level privileges. So I can also filter out these ones I don't need to care about. So I click on that, so I can see that demo admin was used on the server as an as admin account, and this person was the actual individual behind those accesses. Coming back, I can choose to export those sessions only. These entries uh, uh, belong to these two particular sessions. I don't want to play these sessions back one by one. I can turn to the uh, search functionality uh, of the audio player application, which basically searches for uh, textual keywords that uh, appeared during the end user session on the end user screen or console. Uh, for graphic, for character oriented protocols, this uh, functionality works with the textual output of the console, so you could say it's, uh, it's uh, rather easier than doing it for graphical protocols. In case of graphical sessions, the RD player implements an optical character recognition algorithm, so when I do the searches, it analyzes the end user sessions tries to uh, re recognize every textual content and match uh, them against my search criteria. So if I type here the service name I know uh, has been stopped, I hit find. Um, optical character recognition happens in the background and everything goes fine. These trails have been filtered to only those that somebody in the session contain my search uh, criteria, which uh, the result is one. If I do a playback, I have two options. I can either do a playback from the beginning, just to show you uh, what we mean by movie like playback. The player reconstructs the original session from the recorded network traffic. So, I see exactly the same thing in the same screen resolution, screen quality uh, the end users saw. And I don't want to play back the session from beginning to the end. I'd like to jump to the relevant session and see the user activity in context. The, there's a white line on the timeline that shows me where my search criteria appears on the end user screen. If I move my mouse over it, even shows me what context. So if there are multiple occurrences, I can select the one that, uh, that is interesting for me. So I can jump right here, and when the white line starts, spool will appear on the screen. There you are. And when the white line ends, it's going to disappear. So basically, that was all I planned for uh, for this demonstration. Obviously, there are a lot more um, to both products that could be showcased, but considering the limited time, uh, that was I planned these scenarios, which I think uh, showcases the, uh, the interoperability and integration of the two products uh, the best. That's great. Thank you so much. That was an excellent demonstration. I'm going to jump back to the slide deck and just go, just do a couple more slides just to talk about now that you've seen it, what are the next steps? So the next steps, you know, we would be very happy to individually or collectively uh, set up a customized demo for your organization in your environment to address your particular goals or questions and um, <clears throat> or challenges. 
And also you can talk to a sales representative from either of our corporations at any time. And again, I'll be sending you a copy of this slide deck. So now I would like to open it up for questions. And again, if you have questions, you can submit them at the top of your screen in the Q&A tab. And I do have a question in queue right now. And the question from Kelly is, how do you access the servers with administrative privileges if the shell control box and password manager fail? Great question. Um, I don't know. Laszlo, how would you uh, answer that? Well, thank you. Um, you have to have a local – you can have a local account, and uh, it can be used for an escape situation. But generally, if SCB fails, that way that uh, uh, that routing will not work for you. So you have to to change the normal way, and you have to change your existing network setup. There is an easy way to do that in a case of SCB. Okay, great. And uh, in the case of Enterprise Random Password Manager, uh, we you know we just log in and get the get a new password. We'll change. You can change the password again and then retrieve a new password for it. So. Um, shouldn't be a problem. So any other questions? Again, if you'd like to submit your questions at the Q&A tab at the top of the screen, we're open. We're taking your questions. We're happy to do so.